Well, good morning. Good morning. I see people I haven't seen in a while there. Um, it's good to be here. It's good to see you here on this warm, toasty day. This is just evidences of things, you know, that you can look forward to that one day this will all be gone and snow will be back and you will feel so much better. Okay, so we'll just encourage ourselves in that this morning. Um, my name is Dave Magoon. I'm one of the pastors here. For those of you that are watching at home, welcome. A couple of announcements, just real quick. Uh, if you do have an offering, we do have an offering basket in the back. You just place the offering in there and we take care of that. We don't pass the baskets around at this point in time during the pandemic. But thank you for your giving. Again, uh, you guys have been outstanding in how you've supported the church through this time. And it's, I, I know of other churches that are struggling financially. Um, I know of other churches that aren't even meeting. So God's blessed us in, in uh, incredible ways. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, for a couple of other announcements real quick. Um, on the 9th, we are going to be having a baptism here. The baptism is going to be after the service. That's August 9th. And it will it'll be 1130 when it happens. So what we're going to do is invite the whole church and the person that's being baptized is going to be inviting friends and family. So it's possible that some people may need to sit downstairs, but we cannot see why we can't... Uh, work that out so that we can arrange it so that we have the social distancing so as many people can come to a baptism as possible that's a just a celebratory time so that's uh august 9th so keep that in mind and that will take place after the service if you want to stay at home and watch the service and then come afterwards you could do that as well um, we're also looking into streaming the baptism service too uh, for those of you that received your children's ministry email and you responded to it, uh, Bauer, Ted, and Aaron would like to thank you for your response. And if you have not responded to your email, they are coming to get you. So keep that in mind uh, so you can respond to that quickly. But thank you. Thank you for those that responded. <clears throat> okay. I used up all my saliva. I need a drink. So what we're going to be doing this morning is we're continuing in the series on parables. And I think it's an appropriate thing that I get the wedding feast. But I'm not going to talk about food. It, it was very disappointing when I started looking at this. I'm going to talk about food. This is a wedding feast. And there's really nothing in there about, about food. But, uh, <laughs> but what we are going to do is, is <clears throat> look at this parable. It's one of those parables where um, Jesus uses parables in a lot of different ways, but this is one of those parables where he likes to step on toes. So I could line you all up and just step on your toes and we can all go home, or you can listen to what I have to say. So one or the other, if you'd like your toes stepped on, let me know. Um, it is good to have our toes stepped on at times. So what I'm going to do first is pray and then, instead of reading the whole passage, I'm going to read it in sections under each point. So that's how we'll divide it up today. And we'll see where we go from that. So let's pray. So Father, thank you for the opportunity, the privilege, the blessing it is to look at your word. And we ask, Lord, that as we look at your word this morning, that it would come alive to us. Spirit of God, Make it alive to us. It's a living and active word. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, that you would help me to be true to your word. And um, Lord, that fruit comes from it. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'd like to right off the bat read, read my main point. Uh, the main point <clears throat> whether we get to this or not, the main point of this message is humility and compassion are characteristics of a follower of Jesus and calls us to evaluate our hearts. Humility and compassion are characteristics of a follower of Jesus and calls us to evaluate our heart. Okay. 
So we're, again, we're, this is a, a series that we're doing on the parables of the kingdom. Parables are lessons that bring kingdom truths into our lives. This is the purpose. This is why Jesus is telling us these things. It brings spiritual depth to us, to a people. We're not prone to those things. We're not prone to spiritual depth. We, our tendency is to just kind of skirt around them, and Jesus brings our attention to them. So we need these kingdom foundations in our lives, and Jesus taught many of them through parables. And it, they help us to measure ourselves, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to measure ourselves. We're going to evaluate ourselves. We're going to look at our hearts as we look at his word this morning. So the first point, and I'll get right into it, I've made my points questions. So these, the first question I have today is, are you a watcher as well as a doer? Are you a watcher as well as a doer? And I want to read verses 1 through 6 to start us off. Starting at verse 1, Luke chapter 14. One Sabbath, when he went to dine, at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him, he healed him, and he sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. So it was a Sabbath day, and Jesus was invited. There were preparations for the Sabbath dinner. That's usually what happened. Everything was prepared beforehand, and everybody would meet after the services, and they would gather together. They came to listen. They came to worship. They came to learn they came to celebrate the Sabbath together. And Jesus was invited to this. It doesn't say that the ruler invited him. It's the ruler, ruler of the Pharisees that had the dinner. It doesn't say that he invited Jesus. But Jesus was invited to this dinner by somebody. And there was a lot of watching going on. Okay, As soon as Jesus comes into a room, people watch. If Jesus came into the room this morning, wouldn't we all watch him? Wouldn't we all just start to look at him? And that's what they would do. They would, they would watch him. They were watching Jesus. They were watching to judge him. They were watching to criticize him. They were watching to catch him, doing something that he shouldn't be doing so that they could charge him with something. But you have to remember, when Jesus comes into a room, he's also watching. And Jesus was starting to watch, and he was assessing the people's need. He was seeing what was going on. He was finding opportunities to teach them. This is what Jesus did. And so while there, and while they were there, it says, behold. You know, so I don't know if this was a setup for Jesus or something happened, but behold, there was a man there with dropsy. Now, this isn't somebody that drops things, okay? That's not the condition of dropsy. If you look at the Greek word that dropsy, uh, how it's translated dropsy, it means pooling. Or in other words, the person was, um, fluid was gathering in his body. It's possible that he had uh, some sort of heart condition, and basically he was swelling. And it's a serious condition. It's a, uh, something to be concerned. It could be congestive heart failure. Um, so it's life-threatening, and Jesus sees him there, and Jesus isn't the type to just, you know, if something beholds him right then and there, he's not the type just to, to let things go. So he says, while he's standing there, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And the Pharisees remain silent. Nobody says anything. They just remain silent. So Jesus heals them. So it's a big deal. Jesus healed this person. Now, I like to think of, about it when, uh, when Jesus healed somebody, there was, there was something happened. When Jesus healed the deaf, what happened? They were able to hear. Okay? When Jesus healed the blind person, what happened? They were able to see. Okay? When Jesus raised somebody from the dead, what happened? 
they came to life. I mean, these are drastic things that happen. So when he heals a swollen man, what happened? He must have shrunk. I'm the, I'm, that's the only way I can see it. So I see it. That's the, the first time I ever said, what happened after the guy that was swollen was healed by Jesus? He came in swollen. He left probably 20, 30 pounds lighter. I don't know. But, but then he asks another question. He makes these observations. He's saying, Jesus is saying, these, these people don't seem to have much compassion. So he asks another question. Which of you having a son, in other versions it says donkey, uh, the, the, <laughs> Uh, it's translated son, and that's why we have it in here as son, but sometimes it's used as a, as a young donkey, the same word, because I suppose kids can act like donkeys sometimes. Which of you, having a son or an ox, has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? Again, they don't reply. They don't say anything. You know, there's a rabbinic teaching that says, you know, even though the Old Testament is very specific about obeying the laws of the land, this rabbinic teaching that says that human life, and it talks about it in the beginning of Genesis, human life is more important. Saving a human life is more important. If you look at Genesis 127, it says, and God created man in his image, and the image of God, he created them. Clearly, the life of the human was special to God. Therefore, that would supersede the laws. And that's why when they, did Jesus get in trouble for doing this? Did he get arrested? Did he break the laws? Was it okay for him to do it? Absolutely it was okay for him to heal them. There was no problem with that or not. The Pharisees knew that. And they knew they couldn't do anything about it because it was a human life. It was important. Jesus was a watcher and he was watching them and he saw that they struggled with legalism. They saw that they struggled with lack of compassion. Jesus wanted to address their heart. And that's what he does for us. He likes to address our heart. So this, he was the watcher. Jesus was a watcher and a doer, and he's trying to show them this. And this leads me to my second point. Do you look at the world as God intended? Do you see the world as God intended? I mean, we look at the world in a lot of different ways, and we see a lot of different things that are going on in the world today. And how do we see it? Do we see it as God intends? I want to read verses 7 through 11 of chapter 14. It says, now he told a parable. Now, in, in light of what just happened, he's telling a parable. This is a transition moment for Jesus. He says, now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you'll begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up to a higher place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now we're starting to get to, he's already addressed their compassion. Now he's starting to talk about their pride. He's starting to see here, okay, this is another issue that we have to look at. So Jesus choosing a wedding feast for this parable, it's a wedding. Weddings, we know weddings, they require a lot of planning. There's a menu, okay, the food thing, a menu, a guest list, it's a big deal. I don't think they had place cards for different, apparently they didn't have place cards for people to sit at because then we wouldn't have this seating issue. Maybe that's why Jesus said, you know what, you better put place cards down there and that's why we do it today, you know? Who knows? But, um, you know, 
I don't know if you guys ever had a relative. I had a relative that always spilled water. So nobody wanted to sit next to this guy. So if you had a wedding or if you had an event or something like that. So you had to be very strategic. You have to be very strategic as to where you put people. But back then, everybody just wanted to go to the best seat. I want to be the closest. I want to be able to see. I want to be able to hear. I want to be able to do this and that. And everybody wanted to do that. We can be like that today. People can be like that today. Black Friday shopping. You want to be the first one there. You're going to jam through that door and cause a, a stampede of people to go through there because it's important. I want to get there. I want the best thing. We, we do that. We tend to do that. We get what we want. We want to either get what we want or people to perceive us in a certain way so that we look the way they want us. We want them to see us. But... People would get there early to get a good seat, and they were more concerned about their status, they were more concerned about their position than anything else. So Jesus is using this because it's a familiar thing, and people, for the most part, know how they work. So Jesus brings this new perspective to a familiar thing. This is what Jesus did with a lot of his parables. He brought a familiar thing, and he brought this twist to it so that you would start to think. Do you ever notice that sometimes when, you're, when you get something that's totally new, your face kind of changes? You know, you just kind of go. You ever, does that ever happen to you? Okay. That's what happened with scripture, spiritual things. I don't know if it's a spiritual thing with the brain and the face, but all of a sudden you go like this. Okay. And this is kind of what happens with these people. They start to look at them and they're going, humble? Be careful about where we sit? What, what are you talking about? So, parables cause us to think. They cause our faces to change, but they cause us to think. It's not just a story. It's something to promote some sort of wise teaching that the Lord wants us to understand. You ask yourself the question when you hear these parables, am I offended? Or is it an aha moment? And this is what Jesus was banking on with these people. Were they going to get offended by it? Or were they going to say, oh, wait a minute. There's something here that's helpful for me. So we ha he wants them to consider their own heart. And that's what he wants us to do. Consider our own heart. If you exalt, you can become humble. If you stay humble, you can be exalted. In our passage, Jesus t often teaches the opposite of what we think would be normal. For example, you will save by your life by giving it away. You will save your life by giving it away. The greatest among you should be the servant. You see, you see what, what he does here, and he shows these things to us to cause us to think people he says people shouldn't be running for the best seat because if you are exalting yourself you will be humbled it causes them to wonder it causes them to ponder it causes them to think about it to take the lowest seat a few years ago abby was able to uh was offered some tickets to a rhode island philharmonic uh, concert and they were really nice seats these seats were like the pr primo seats and Abby was offered them and she said you know what I'm gonna ask my parents if they want to go and then I'll buy a ticket at the nosebleed section and then she'll sit up there and then we'll meet up afterwards so she gave us these seats now these seats were like mucho bucks seats and these seats uh, actually they were season tickets of someone that was very important within the philharmonic and they were the perfect place this was like the 50 yard line at gillette stadium seats this is like sitting behind home plate seats at fenway okay if queen elizabeth was to come to the rhode island philharmonic they would have given her these Seats. I mean, these were how good these seats were. When you sat there, there was not a head in front of you. The sound was perfect. 
that would come up. Everything was nice about it, and we had these seats. These were like the best seats in the house. So Roxanne and I go there, and we're, we, we get in there, and we're, we find our seats, and the usher brings us to our seat. They don't bring hot dogs to those seats like they do at Fenway, though. But anyway, we, we get our seats, and we sit down, and other people started to come, because we're always early for everything. So other people started to come, and they're sitting. And these people that are sitting around us, these are big wigs, too, in the Rhode Island Philharmonic. These like are these financial big wigs for the state of Rhode Island, and they're all sitting around us. And so, you know, they, they kind of glance over at us and kind of look away, and they glance over and nod, and they kind of look away. But after a while, you can start to feel eyes looking at you, and these eyes were saying, who in the world are you sitting in so-and-so's seat? And it caused, I don't know if it caused Roxanne, it caused me to feel like I didn't belong there. It was something. Now, we had tickets. We had an usher show us. But what if I would have showed up there and said, let's see, what are the best seats of the place? And you sneak in there, and you go and you sit down, and Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so show up to sit in their seats. You're going to have to move. And you're probably not even going to get the cheap seats. You're probably going to get thrown out. But this is the thing. We don't want to put ourselves in a place where all of a sudden it's, it's, it's this exaltation of ourselves that brings us to a place where we think we are more than we are. And everybody does it. Some people more than others. I mean, I know very humble people, but I know they would say, I still struggle with this. I still have this problem as well. I have no idea where I am in my notes, but anyway. But these people that we sat with, they were so influential, and it, and it caused us to think about our own condition. It caused us to think about who, who are we that we would have these nice seats. It was a blessing. It was a blessing, but we don't want to take those blessings for granted. God raised us up, and he gave us those seats. And it was, it was a, uh, a really memorable point in our lives. But Jesus' point is, if we humble ourselves, we may find that someday someone else will honor us. If we humble ourselves, God will honor us. You know, it's one of those things, and we want to be careful that humility, the definition of humility... The definition of humility is to lower oneself, to bring down one's pride, to have a modest opinion of oneself. Even if you're good at something, have a modest opinion of yourself. Unless you're Muhammad Ali, you have a modest opinion because he's the greatest. A modest opinion of yourself. To behave in an unassuming manner. That's what humility is. And that's what we're to learn to walk in and to realize who we are. The Pharisees were very familiar with this concept. In Proverbs 25, 6 and 7, it says, Don't exalt yourself in the king's presence. and Do not claim a place among the great men. It is better for him to say, come up here, than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. The Pharisees knew. They understood this. They just weren't adhering to the word of God. Jesus is saying here that we should realize that there are more important people than ourselves. It's a very rude awakening, isn't it? There are people that, more, that are more important than, our, than we are. It's not our default setting for us to think that we're not of some importance. And we have to realize, really, that there are more important people, that we're supposed to see other people as more important than ourselves. You know, we're raised in this country to excel. We, we live in the land of opportunity. We are supposed to be successful. Money is a measurement of success. Property is the measurement of success. Status is the measurement of success. How many likes you get on Facebook is the measurements of success. And what happens is we condition ourselves, we condition our children, and it continues on and on and on. You know, you have the Queen song, we are the champions, my friend, okay? No time for losers, because we are the champions. Everybody loves the song, but it teaches us, 
you know, and when you start to sing that, you're going, okay, what is a loser? Is it the person I don't like? Is it the person that doesn't fit what I expect? Or is it just the person that lost the game? You know, we start to look at these things and it conditions us and it affects us in a way so that we think that we are better than others. Because of that, sometimes we don't think we have to adhere to anything either because we are us. We are we, I was going to say. We are us. We think that we can break the rules. Tell me how well that worked for Eve in the garden. Yes, she was deceived. She thought, this isn't going to apply to me. I can eat this fruit. And it didn't work out well for her. So Jesus is addressing the fact that we see ourselves as the center of the universe, right here. Uh, this is the center, and everybody revolves around me. And really, that's a lie of the enemy, and it's something that we need to understand. We are not to think ourselves more highly than we are, it says in Romans 12. In order to do that, we have to assume that we are not more than we are. Okay, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. It says in James 4, if honor is due us, let others do it. If honor is due us, let others do it. Let someone else offer us the better seat. Let someone else tell us we did a good job at work. We don't have to promote ourselves. If we are in Christ, we have everything we need. We're a child of the king. It's hard to walk humbly, but if we do, the Lord gives grace to the humble. That's what it says. The Lord raises us up to where we're supposed to be. And better yet, there are blessings that come in the future that we will receive. So Jesus is hoping to get us to look at ourselves and to look at the world as God intended. And hopefully that's what we will start to do. This brings me to my last point, point three. How does a humble and compassionate heart change the world around you? How does a humble and compassionate heart change the world around you? I want to read verses 12 through 14. He said also to the man who had invited him, this is the man who had invited Jesus. It wasn't necessarily the ruler of the Pharisees, but the man who had invited Jesus. And I don't know whether he pulled him aside or not to talk to him, or if he was just telling Everybody could hear him, but he said to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, invite the crippled, invite the lame, invite the blind, and you'll be blessed because you cannot, they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So again, Jesus talks to this man, and maybe others were hearing him, and he says, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory here, isn't it? He says, when you have a party, don't invite the friends and the family and the rich people, because they'll invite you back. You'll end up having a dinner club. And you'll go, you know, how that, that's, that's how the cliff walk kind of started down in Newport, Rhode Island. The cliff walk was a path that went to everybody's mansion. And they used to have these parties, and they'd all walk down the path. And then when that was done, they'd all walk home. And that's how it kept going. And it kept going like that. And all these people just kind of hung out together for their summer events. And, and that was it. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't just stay among yourselves. Don't get ingrown in your life, but stretch out. Start to think of others. Don't think about what you can get out of it. Don't try to impress your neighbors. If you're humble and compassionate, you'll see things in a humble and compassionate way. You look to see how you can bless others. To be a blessing you will be a blessing in a better way. You will be blessed in a better way. If you're going to be, get a blessing, God will bless you to get you that. Verse 14 says, 
You'll be blessed if you do it. What's the word blessed mean? This, this was something I, you know, we always say, oh, that person's such a blessing. That song was such a blessing. Everything is this and that blessing. And we were wondering, what does it mean? So I wanted to find out what the Greek word meant so that I could kind of get a little understanding about what does this blessing mean? We often spiritualize the term and we think it's some sort of secret condition that all of a sudden we're zapped with something. Or what does it really mean? So I looked it up and it says, it means happy. That's what it means. It means happy. So many people today say, if only I could be happy. All I want out of life is to be happy. They think money will make them happy. Position will make them happy. A better job will make them happy. If only I could be happy. Happiness comes from God. You want to be happy, be blessed by God. It's a kingdom principle. If you bless others, you will be blessed. As funny as it sounds, to make others happy, you'll be happy. If you make others happy, you will be happy. If you have a humble and compassionate heart. Be humble in attending a feast. Be humble and compassionate when giving a feast. Simple truths that Jesus is talking about here. Acts of kindness may not be rewarded in this world, but it'll be remembered later on, the resurrection of the just. It's simply this. Think of and care for people less fortunate than you. That's what Jesus did. Think of people and care for people less fortunate for you. Do this for people that can't pay you back. Now, why did Jesus share all of this? And, you know, when you start to look at these, these parables, you go, you go back and forth and you say, well, there's a, yeah, there's a practical element here. Yeah, I should do this and that. But is he trying to show us something about himself? And I think he is trying to show us something here. He, see, Jesus didn't come just to give party tips. Okay, he wasn't the Miss Manners of the first century. That is not the purpose of Jesus coming. He came because he was compassionate. He wanted to teach us, and he wanted to be an example for us. He was coming into a lost world, and he, what he did, and this is, this is classic, he invited the spiritually poor. He invited the spiritually lame. He invited the spiritually blind. That's all of us. And he invited us to join him. And one day we will have a great banquet together with him. He humbled himself, taking the form of a man to suffer the punishment that we deserve, to conquer death and hell that we were to experience, and to bless us, to make us happy throughout all eternity. He truly is our example in life, and he is our example in death. So consider the way you see the world around you. Start to begin to ask the Lord, how can I, how can I better express the love and the compassion and the humility of Jesus in this world today? And I think you will open your eyes. I think you'll see some incredible things. Well, let's pray. So, Father, we are grateful to you for the sending of your son to teach us so many things. There are so many practical things, Lord, and we are so lacking in so many ways. We ask, Father, that you would help us. Help us to see that you have given up so much for us. And Lord, I pray for those that may feel like they're spiritually lame today. Maybe they're spiritually blind. Lord, I pray that you will come and bring healing to their souls. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to us who have walked with you for a season and maybe have forgotten how we should express your love and your care and your compassion, how we should walk out with humility the life that you have given us and you paid so much for. So, Lord, help us, we pray. 
But we thank you, Lord, for your word and what it means to us. In Jesus' name, amen.